Numenera as a game is very upfront about the reality that it is not designed around combat. It is based on discovery, using a rule set that is, by design, focused on narrative gameplay. This doesn't mean, however, that the game is without combat or that interesting combat scenarios aren't possible. The game is open to combat and physical conflicts, it just makes the most out of such encounters when they're contextualized by discovery and narrative intrigue. In this video, I'm going to be showing one approach to building an encounter in Numenera. Using my own experience with the game, I'll start from the premise of an interesting combat situation and build it out from there to focus on discovery while providing the potential for interesting outcomes and player agency. This encounter will encompass a few different concepts and motivations, but it will still place combat at the center as a proof of concept. These represent many of my own personal takes on the game and are by no means a definitive or exhaustive approach to designing an encounter in Numenera. I won't be getting too much into the theoretical meta-speak of what an encounter is. Instead, I'm going to be working with the most generalized concept that an encounter represents an immediate challenge to the party, one which they have to address before they can move on to anything else. While it may involve conflict or combat, it almost always stresses urgency. Something is happening in the world and the party must deal with it now. The nature of an RPG's mechanical system enables us as players and GMs to abstract out time, luck, strengths, weaknesses, and more to move through an urgent situation in an orderly fashion. It is also important to stress that Numenera and the Cypher system are not tactically oriented games where it concerns their combat. I would personally argue that there are enough combat mechanics and abilities to make for an intricate fight, but familiar concepts such as flanking, attacks of opportunity, or even precise movement on a map are not really provided in the rules. If these are important to how you enjoy combat in an RPG, we might consider bolting on some extra rules to the cipher system. Stick around till the end of the video for some of my own personal preferences for including these classic D20-esque combat concepts into Numenera naturally and seamlessly without adjusting or making up too many rules on their own. Before considering the details of this encounter, I do want to focus on the unique challenges of designing a Numenera encounter in the abstract, meaning without an attached adventure or campaign. When we're considering the goals of Numenera as concerning discovery and narrative growth, the context of an existing story, be it in the course of a one-shot adventure or a campaign that stretches for years, is really important for framing an encounter. We should assume, whether designing in the abstract or not, that this encounter is existing in a place in the Ninth World, and that there are motivations of PCs or NPCs likely connected to this. This will help us find a home for the encounter if we're just building out a set of creatures, NPCs, and PCs for a combat scenario. Every character connected to this encounter, in one way or another, has a vested interest in certain outcomes. This means that we ought to think of encounters as having importance. Whether they involve combat or not, this is a determinative moment for the party, and things could work out in any number of ways for them. When building our encounter, especially in the abstract, we should ask, particularly of the NPCs, who is involved directly in this fight? Who is involved indirectly? What is a likely scenario for this encounter to be existing? As we examine the setting and the creatures we're likely to populate the encounter with, it'll be good to return to these questions, as they'll not only help the encounter find a home in an adventure or campaign, but will also serve as a bit of a feedback loop to pack the encounter with more interesting details. Another challenge of designing a Numenera encounter in the abstract is considering the party. If designed completely in the abstract, there won't be a sense of the strengths, weaknesses, and interests of specific player characters. This represents a wildly unpredictable variable that is challenging to design for. Characters in Numenera, even at Tier 1, are already incredibly competent at what they do, but will likely be carrying ciphers or artifacts that could substantially turn the tide of an entire encounter in one action. There are some ciphers that could effectively end an entire encounter after one turn. This is to say nothing of the potential for minor and major effects, as well as player intrusions which can radically shift a situation with almost limitless player creativity. 
We can plan for this by creating other unpredictable variables as well, examining ways in which the environment and potential narrative situation can create a more dynamic and engaging encounter. If the PCs end up using their abilities, ciphers, or player intrusions to get through the combat quickly in creative and narratively interesting moments, this is fine. The job of the GM designing this encounter is to craft an environment that continues to provide the opportunities for players to use what's at their disposal. If a player is able to face a complex situation and overcome it with either the base concepts of what they built their character to do, or through creative uses of the rules, this is something to celebrate. Encounters are opportunities for players to show who their characters really are when they're in a bind. As I said in the opening, I'm going to start designing this encounter by just jumping into combat. I'll start with a simple idea. I'd like the players to fight individual creatures who are in the presence of, perhaps guarding even, a more dangerous creature kept in a cage. This of course should be a fairly common template for an RPG encounter. We have about a half a dozen or so individuals, and a much more dangerous one kept locked away. One who, it will be very likely, will escape the cage during the course of combat and become a threat all on their own. I like this because it allows for straightforward one-on-one -on -one combat scenarios with the individual creatures, but can make way for a whole other phase of the combat when or if the large creature breaks free of its constraints. For my individual fighters, I'm going with a personal favorite of mine. The Orgolian Soldier, as found in Numenera Discovery, is a level 4 creature. It presents a difficult target number for PCs to hit, deals damage that isn't immediately scary but can add up over time, has enough armor to force players to spend effort to guarantee substantial damage, often works in a group with other soldiers, and has enough health to withstand a few rounds of combat. They can carry melee and ranged weapons, meaning they can adapt to the flow of an encounter quite well, and their increased mobility and perceptive abilities make them particularly challenging to outrun or hide from. As the Numenera lore concerns the Oregolian soldiers, they're a versatile creature as they can be found virtually anywhere in the Ninth World, with an implied backstory that's incredibly malleable, providing for either mysterious agendas that may never be fully understood by Ninth World humans, or, given that they are mechanical constructs, they could be programmed by and forced under the control or orders of a known or unknown NPC. For the larger and more dangerous creature, I went with the Ninth World Bestiaries Moral, a more powerful and wildly different type of creature than the Oregolians. Should the Moral play a role in the encounter, they can easily shift things dramatically for the PCs. The combat will start with the party facing off against the Oregolians, and under the right conditions, the Moral may very well enter the fight. I want to make sure the Moral is sufficiently scary enough for players, something they don't want out of the cage if they can help it. The creature already resists physical attacks as level 6, meaning the players will have to roll an 18 to hit if they don't apply any effort or special abilities. It also means that any scenarios that hinder a player's ability to attack will push this creature up to an effective level of 7, making attacks impossible without spending the effort necessary to lower the target number under 21. They also have the ability to pull characters into their flesh, causing them to swiftly move down the damage track, killing players very swiftly if they're not careful. So far, we have a combat encounter that involves a challenging group of individual fighters and one potentially greater threat restrained, at risk of entering the fight at some point. From here, we can turn to figuring out where to set our encounter to make things more interesting. While the Oregolians will be an interesting and fairly direct challenge for the players, setting a large moral in a cage on the scene is sure to draw the player's attention. I want the setting for this encounter to be a space where a potentially loose creature who can pull players into their skin for significant damage will present a distinctly urgent and immediate challenge a memorable challenge. I decided to place this in a tight quarters situation, and to ensure that the party can't easily just turn and run, this tight quarter will actually be a train car, a freighting vessel to be sure. This will provide enough room for movement and strategy, but since it's still relatively small and in motion, the party will have to more seriously consider what will happen if that moral gets out and starts sloshing all over the place with its acidic fluids. I want the train to be a bit more unique, so I rolled randomly 
randomly on a table in Injecting the Weird and Return the Result, made of translucent organic sacs and tubes. And while the idea of a living train is perfectly weird enough for Numenera, in my mind I already saw a cold, metal freight train, maybe filled with crates and other machinery. Perhaps the moral's cage is fixed to the ceiling of the car via some kind of pulley system. Instead of making the entire train itself made of translucent organic sacs and tubes, I instead imagine that perhaps these freight cars are actually carried by a kind of creature, a massive skeletal-like worm hundreds of feet long with translucent organic sacs and tubes running throughout its length. Humans have attached large freighting cars on top of it and ride it across large distances to transport a variety of goods. Let's call these creatures driftworms. They exhibit a low level of intelligence which can be interacted with a networked piece of Numenera in the form of a control console that can issue basic speed and directional commands. At the end of the day, however, the driftworm is a living creature and may or may not choose to act on its own accord. This represents an unpredictable variable in the encounter that can drastically change things and respond to powerful player actions in a way that increases the complexity and intensity of the encounter. I wasn't immediately sure where a train could be placed in the ninth world, so I tossed it in a wide desert-like area. The cloud crystal sky fields are perfect for this. Already the encounter is starting to sound a lot more interesting. The party finds itself on a speeding freighting vessel made up of freighting carts strapped to a large skeletal worm-like creature notable for their translucent organic sacs and networks of tubes. Inside one of these cars, they're to face off against hostile mechanical creatures who appear to be guarding a large moral in captivity. This is where the encounter really began to look for a narrative situation to insert itself and is a great place to brainstorm a potential list of reasons why this situation is even happening in the first place. When building an encounter in the abstract, context should probably be considered when it finally starts poking through, asking unavoidable questions of the designer. Since this encounter isn't being thought of for a specific adventure or campaign, I won't create a list of definitive answers, but instead will reflect on a number of suggestions and speculations. As you'll see, this does a lot more than just insert backstory. It will instead allow the encounter to become more interesting, as it has unique narrative ties and hooks. As I was designing the combat, it came out rather naturally that the Orgolians are protecting or guarding this creature. This gives us a bit of backstory to consider. Who or what are they guarding it for? The Argolians are described in the book usually as having mysterious motives stemming from orders that may be a million years old or more. Giving them a basic task like guarding a creature being shipped somewhere isn't so mysterious, so it's very likely that someone has a serious interest in transporting this creature and is either directly or indirectly in control of the Orgolians to facilitate this. Perhaps this is some ninth world noble who wants the moral for their own exotic biology collection. Perhaps this is a noble that the party is on the bad side of, and they are either going to try and prevent this creature from going there, or just trying to screw up an antagonist's plan. Even if the party will come to have no direct connection with this situation, the narrative framework behind the encounter immediately defines one of the functions of the Orgolians. They are to protect the moral. This means that they're unlikely to release it and will instead probably move in such a way as to mitigate potential damage to the creature they merely see as property being transported. We now have an understanding of what the Orgolians will be fighting for, and this will help guide their behavior during the course of the encounter. They no longer exist solely for the players to make attack rolls against. But what of the player motivation where it concerns the moral, or even player motivation for why the party is here to begin with? Sometimes an adventure will automatically provide these answers, but since we don't have an adventure at hand or a group of party members with narrative interest, we can plan for a lot of different outcomes. Perhaps the players are here to steal the moral. Perhaps they're here to destroy it. Perhaps they've come upon it randomly while exploring this driftworm train and will think of what to do with this creature in a more improvised way, focusing on destroying it if it's proving too great a threat or possibly even creating a scenario where the moral escapes and becomes a threat to the Orgolians as much as it is a threat to them. Maybe this cage moral provides a bit of information about an NPC's interests or motivations. It is likely the case that if this caged moral is destined for somewhere, its cage probably has some kind of mobility function either for itself or for it to be attached to something that will move it. This allows for the PCs to find ways of taking the creature should that be of interest. 
The train car itself should probably be built in such a way as to allow for the cage and creature to be moved with relative safety and ease. For this reason, perhaps there is a large set of double doors on this car that open to allow for movement, likely indicating that there should be a set of mechanisms to control it. We're already beginning to see some expected behaviors and possibilities for the encounter here. The Orgolians will behave in such a way as to eliminate the threat of the party, but will do so with caution as their objective is protecting the moral in transit. The PCs may have a number of interests here, and with a large set of doors and the ability possibly to manipulate the location of the cage by some kind of mechanism allows for much more than just combat to be the central focus here. What of the discovery, though? Discoveries can take on a number of different shapes and forms, and depending on the context of the adventure this encounter may live in, there could be a few different outcomes. If the moral, and whomever it belongs to or is being sent to, contains some secret for the party, there is an opportunity for narrative discovery and development here, as the party may come to learn some interesting secrets. Perhaps they had no idea about the moral being here, but find records of secret experiments the Order of Truth is conducting on creatures like morals. They've made a discovery about the world here and will be awarded XP for it, as well as some new information to continue the story forward. This entire encounter can be a pretty important narrative discovery for the players. As I said, it's important to think of encounters, especially in Numenera, as having purpose and urgency. The hostility of the Orgolians and the danger of the moral makes this urgent, and there's clearly a purpose behind why there's even a caged moral being guarded on a speeding train to begin with. The players may come to discover something interesting about this situation and why it is happening. This could either be directly or indirectly associated with main story and adventure themes, meaning that this encounter could tie into a greater narrative or be an interesting side story. In the creature listing for the Orgolians, it is mentioned that one of the ways these machines might communicate or be controlled is through sound. This is a really great discovery the PCs could come upon, allowing them to make the most out of any powers or ciphers that deal with sound, sparking interesting and creative outcomes. This is a very actionable discovery as it represents a bit of information the party can take with them. Should they encounter Orgolians again in the future, they may have discovered from this encounter that they have a particular weakness or at least an association with sound, and that controlling sound might play a significant role in reducing the threat that they pose. I may also want to consider larger opportunities for discovery, and that's where I'll take a look at the Driftworm that serves for now essentially as a train. As I said before, the Driftworm is going to be my wild card as a GM. This is an unpredictable variable that I can control using GM intrusions when I feel that the situation could use a bit of change or acceleration. What could the players discover by this creature existing in the encounter, though? It may just be as simple as the players discovering that out in the cloud crystal sky fields, such creatures are outfitted with large train cars and used to move people and items. The Ninth World as a setting is one without grand levels of industry and domestication. Humanity has gained a lot of power and knowledge from the Numenera, but they are far from this setting's masters of the material realm. This creature should then still be a bit wild. Perhaps many of them are being used as a train, but we shouldn't expect to see tracks or even large train stations. They are likely very reliable, but they come with the chance of the Driftworm making up its own mind before, during, or after a large trip. Spontaneously, I imagine that perhaps this worm could fly, and that it normally hovers over the ground at around 10 to 20 feet, but it can ascend much higher. In fact, what if high up in the cloud crystal sky fields, you can find colonies of these large drift worms? Perhaps they even drag unused train cars up there with them, building structures in the sky very similar to artificial reefs that form when ships sink or are abandoned. Maybe they've constructed an entire settlement in the sky and that other creatures are calling home as well, perhaps even humans. This could exist high up in the air, among the floating crystals of this portion of the setting, awaiting discovery by the party. The potential out comes of this encounter include a discovery that fits into a greater narrative depending on the adventure, a discovery that players can use in the future in the form of learning about the nature of the Orgolians, and a discovery of an area high up in the cloud crystal sky fields where massive drift worms carry abandoned train cars to the sky to build out spaces for they and others to live in. There's purpose, urgency, and an opportunity for discovery. It's time to start considering how the mechanics can structure out this encounter to go from pure imagination to something a bit more concrete.
So far, our encounter consists of a party facing off against a group of Orgolians guarding a caged moral being transported on a driftworm train moving at a relatively high speed through the Cloud Crystal Sky Fields. How the players got here and what their purpose is in being here will be determined by the adventure, but it will likely involve an adventure where the PCs have some connection, positive, negative, or neutral, to an NPC who's interested in this moral, or the moral itself. The PCs either know of this ahead of time or will learn of it in the moment. When deciding what level certain tasks will be for this encounter, I tend to use the difficulty of the creatures the party is fighting to start with. This gives me a baseline for deciding what activities will be relatively the same, harder, or easier than what it takes to engage in combat with the enemy, in this case, the Orgolians, who are a level 4 creature. While it is the case that Numenera doesn't contain a mathematical formula for balancing encounters, considering the main antagonist's level as the baseline difficulty of the encounter, and making decisions about what should be easier or more difficult in the context of the antagonist's level is a good way to root your decision. Our levels for the creatures are pretty straightforward. The Orgolians are level 4 creatures, meaning attacking and defending demands a target number of 12. They are quite perceptive, bumping their perceptive activities up by a step, and they deal with tasks of dexterity and mobility as two steps above their level. They also have a unique communicative capability that allows them to strategize and plan remotely. The moral comes in at a level 5, but its physical resistances bring it up to a level 6 for defense, demanding an 18 as the starting target number. It has some weaknesses, however, concerning mental attacks. The moral packs a decent punch with 5 damage on a successful hit, but its ability to physically consume players and kill them in a few short turns makes them a particularly dangerous creature to have break free from its constraints. The original point of inspiration for this existing on a train was to create a constrained environment for the players. So my train car is going to be 10 feet wide by about 40 feet long with around 30 foot ceilings. 10 feet is defined as an immediate distance in the game, so players can travel the width of the car and can still make an action in one turn. Alternatively, they can travel the length of the car as their entire action, and with it being assumed that there are some other crates and machinery in the area, so depending on the extent of their movement action, they may have to make a speed-related roll to guarantee that they didn't stumble or trip on something. Let's add a bit more to this train car, though. Offering the roof to players to explore can be interesting, so there should be a ladder that allows for traveling in and out of the car, and perhaps there is a device on top of the car that allows the moral cage to be released. Depending on what happens, the PCs may have to get up there to enable or disable the release function, and it should take at least one full action to get up to the top. We can also put a pair of Orgolians up top, and grabbing inspiration from the creature's stats, one of them can have a back-mounted detonation launcher. While it might not make immediate sense for this to be here, I'll also decide to put the control interface for the Driftworm on top here. I'll also decide to add windows to the train car and will give the Oregolians standing guard up top jetpacks that will enable them to fly alongside the train and shoot through the windows at the party. Characters who fly ought to be able to perform very similar maneuvers. As I said earlier, the Orgolians have an interesting possible relationship to sonic frequencies. In the train car, I'll place sonic emitters that issue the Orgolians their orders. The PCs can spot these devices and use them to issue commands of their own to the soldiers. Since this runs the potential of directly ending the combat encounter, I'll position this as a very difficult task that will require an understanding of what the machines do in the first place to manipulate them. Nano esoteries like Scan or a successful Understanding Numenera check will inform a player that they can use these devices. A level 6 Numenera check will cause the Orgolians to drop their weapons and fight hand to hand, shifting the difficulty to dodge an attack from the Orgolians up but decreasing the damage they can do at just two points. A level 7 Numenera check will cause them to cease their attack function, and a level 8 command will command the Orgolians to listen to players' orders. With the latter two requiring effort to even achieve these outcomes, it should be very rewarding for a player who's trying to think their way out of this fight to suddenly find control over these creatures. The cage that houses the moral can be a level 4 object, and if it moves down the damage track to major damage, it will be possible 
impossible for the moral to break free on its next turn. Manipulating or manually releasing the cage should be a level 4 task, using the device located on the top of the train. The cage is likely designed to keep the moral in. I always like to give my players the opportunity to improvise weapons with what's available in the environment, making the ability to grab a random item and use it as a weapon a simple player intrusion of 1 XP. If the cage is destroyed, a player can activate an intrusion to use a piece of the cage as a weapon. It is up to the player what the improvised weapon looks like, but it could be a bar of the cage in which it functions as a staff type weapon, or it can be a chain like a flail. Depending on what they describe, I'll tell them that they either have a medium or a heavy weapon. At no point during the encounter will I suggest that this is an option for the players, however. I'm planning just in case. I may describe a cage bar or a chain in a way that sparks an idea in a player's head, but I'll want such a turn of circumstances to be mostly coming from player creativity. Given that the cage is meant to keep the moral captive, I would allow any player who decides to wield a piece of the cage as a weapon to ignore the moral's higher defenses and possibly easing the task even a step further depending on the description of their player intrusion requiring only an attack roll of level 5 or 4, so long as they're using the bar or chain from the cage. This would not be communicated to the player directly, but will instead be creatively described, suggesting that the moral perhaps backs away from the player wielding a piece of its cage, since it already knows it has a weakness to the materials in some way. This is the kind of thing I like to think about when anticipating the ways I have seen players spontaneously come up with interesting situations. You can do a little bit of planning ahead of time to allow allow player creativity to really flourish during an encounter. As a final note about the cage, the Orgolians are expected to protect the moral from the players. If the party is getting the upper hand on the soldiers, they will activate an escape sequence, where the side doors on the train car open and a set of propulsion jets on the cage will allow it to safely exit the train and land elsewhere. This whole process should take three turns, one to open the doors, two to activate the cage's mobility feature, and three to release it. We'll make this a procedure an Orgolian has to initiate from a control panel. As I said before, the Drift Worm is my wild card. It's what allows me as the GM to make things more interesting as the entire environment the party is standing in rests on the back of a massive living creature. Given that Numenera can provide abilities, ciphers, and artifacts that could end a difficult combat scenario in one turn, I'll make a rule for myself. If the PCs use any substantially powerful ability or cipher, anything that generates a lot of heat, cold or other environmental change or is explosive will spook the worm and it will do, via a GM intrusion, any number of activities. It can soar into the air, picking up in speed and altitude and making the entire space rough terrain as the players will have to be careful not to lose their balance while walking, running, or fighting in the space. It could flip on its side, perhaps making the side doors on the train car now a massive trap door where objects and characters can fall through. It could also thrash its body around, causing damage to objects inside and consequentially moving the moral cage one step down the damage track. Depending on how the drift worm moves, the PCs may have to make speed defense rolls or lose their footing. I'll set this to a level 6, matching the highest target number set by a creature, that of the moral's physical resistance. Falling PCs will be knocked prone for a turn and may take as much as 2 points of damage that negates armor. This can be particularly scary if any players are on the top of the train car. The difficulty of this and the chance of characters falling to their deaths will depend on the scope and nature of the adventure. For now, I'll set the difficulty to grabbing hold of something on top of the car at level 6, with a chance to grab one of the side windows should they fall off at level 4. Again, depending on the scope of the adventure, it may or may not be appropriate to present falling to one's death as a very real possibility. Spending XP for rerolls and player intrusions, however, are also options available to PCs who are at risk of falling off of the train. As I've said, the Driftworm does have some kind of intelligence, one that the PCs can communicate with via an interfaced console up on top of the car. But some party members may have telepathy. Speed and direction of the Driftworm can be influenced via the console on top of the train starting at level 4, but to play into the discovery of the Driftworm settlement in the sky, the players may notice that the creature keeps trying to rise in altitude and players who can communicate telepathically will only have to speak with the creature at level 3 and will hear the worm say things like home or must ascend in their mind. Based on the range of task difficulties here, this encounter will range from a difficult to an intimidating one, with options for PCs to find easier and more difficult solutions depending on what ciphers and abilities they have, 
as well as what ideas may spring to mind once they're in the heat of the fight. The Orgolians and Moral present a potentially deadly threat, and the Driftworm is an unpredictable variable which can literally flip the PCs on their head if they make too much of a ruckus. While we can't necessarily predict what the party's interest will be in this encounter since it exists without the context of an adventure, we can still assign some purpose and reason for this to be a possible encounter in a game. By tasking the Orgolians as acting in such a way as to defend the moral, they have an agenda beyond just attacking the PCs and will behave accordingly. The Driftworm is a key to a possible discovery for the party, but it is also an opportunity for a GM intrusion that'll radically alter the environment. As for other GM intrusion possibilities, I could use one to force the Orgolians on top of the car to fly down to the windows via their jetpacks, pushing the party to engage in some ranged combat and making use of the rules for cover in Numenera Discovery if it feels like shifting this into a shootout will be more exciting for everyone. Other possible GM intrusions include maybe the Moral managing to reach a tentacle through a cage, grabbing a character and pulling them in not just to the Moral itself, but perhaps into the cage past an electrified boundary. There's a lot of potential here for a dynamic and challenging encounter which will present a number of opportunities for discovery, ones that will feel a lot more relevant once this encounter starts to find a home in a suitable adventure. For now, it remains a template encounter that isn't just about two groups of characters facing off against each other. With the status of the moral and the unpredictable nature of the Driftworm, as well as possibilities like the players hacking into the sonic frequencies that command the Orgolians, everything from a daring battle aboard a living train that's ascending higher into the sky to a stealthy disarming of one of the Ninth World's mysterious automatons is possible here. And there's potential for the encounter to build toward an interesting discovery, either one about the narrative, the creatures the PCs are fighting, or another facet of the world such as the drift worms and their patterns and behaviors. A party of tier 1 characters can likely get through this encounter, but not without substantial risk of death, depending largely on whether or not the moral enters the fight. The levels of some challenges and creatures may need to be adjusted to be harder or easier, and this can be done before or during the combat. It is also possible to adjust the difficulty by means of a GM intrusion that escalates the situation or dramatically changes it in some way. Overall, I find this to be a very exciting encounter to run in Numenera given the unpredictability of what may happen. Given that the system is not built upon some kind of abstracted challenge rating or average party level, the outcome of an encounter like this is not merely assumed to be dealt with by passing difficulty challenges. Instead, the dynamic nature of the system and the kind of narrative thought and design it encourages means that rarely is it ever the case that a direct fight is the only available option, or that if there is a direct fight, it will likely be a very spontaneous and unpredictable one. Numenera doesn't bother with too many tactical rules. It covers the fundamentals of combat and movement and has considerations for things like damage to items, status effects, and a variety of situations that could influence the outcome of a fight. Beyond that, however, it offers very little if any rules for play with a map or considerations for precise grid-like location in a fight. Fortunately, the Cypher system can adapt pretty easily to this style of play and deliver a very identical experience to other tabletop RPGs. My personal method for homebrewing any sort of set of rules is to do the least amount of change to the system itself first, choosing instead to use existing rules to frame what's being added. In this case, I'll be using the Cypher system mechanics to dictate play on a map not using the common standards for map play to make adjustments to the cipher system. While the cipher system suggests using a grid map with a standard 5 foot per square suggestion for space, I actually recommend setting each square to 2 or 3 feet. According to the movement rules of the cipher system, characters can move up to an immediate distance and then take an action as a part of a turn. With a standard 5 foot square map, this means that PCs can only move up to 2 squares per turn as an immediate distance in the game is only about 10 feet. For some, this may not be an issue, but by reducing the footage of each square down to two or three feet, PCs can now move as many as 
five squares on their turn. This has the benefit of not changing the core movement rules, but rather adapts the standards of using a map to fit inside the game's system. The only potential downside to this is that AoE attacks might be a little bit larger than they would be otherwise. A cipher that detonates and explodes in an immediate radius covers a larger space when it's two feet per square than it is at three feet and higher. GMs may want to change the distance up depending on the nature of the encounter or the style of play their group prefers. If you enjoy using a map to tactically plan out movement and your steps, however, counting each square as two feet instead of the standard five is going to give players and GMs a lot more room to work with while making no changes to the core rules of the game. Negative effects or positive effects from flanking is another common situation in many tabletop RPGs and is one that makes sense to have here as well. But this one is simple. If a target is being flanked, their actions are just hindered by one step. So if an Orgolian soldier at level 4 with a target number of 12 is being flanked by two PCs, their effective level in that situation can now be lowered to a 3 with a target number of 9. By this nature, the Orgolian will also attack at level 3 since they're being actively flanked. But if this causes the players to bunch up too much against enemies, you can count attacks as normal, but defenses are hindered. Attacks of opportunity also make sense as having players turn and run from a fight should present some level of difficulty. By asking players who leave an enemy's attack range to make a speed roll against the level of the creature, a player can successfully leave a fight without taking any damage. By making these quick adjustments, players and GMs can engage in cipher system combat on a map with a little bit more of a tactical feel. It's a functional set of common sense rules that will facilitate play on a map without making any serious changes to the core of the game itself. And this is great for groups that want to jump onto a map for major encounters and just desire a little bit more clarity and flexibility when moving minis or tokens around. Any further modifications and adjustments would probably require some more consideration, but adjusting the square size to be two or three feet, hindering a flank target's defense rolls and actions, and requiring a speed roll to disengage from combat or else suffer an attack of opportunity should be all that one needs to make Numenera feel a little bit more at home on a grid, even if the use of maps is rather rare. Numenera may not be focused on combat when it comes to both the rules and the spirit of the game, but that shouldn't keep you from designing engaging encounters that present interesting dangers and opportunities for players. The Ninth World can be a very dangerous place, and there are threats of all kinds in this game. This video reviews one possible encounter using one possible approach. The real secret to designing a Numenera encounter is not to think of what's balanced, but instead think of what will be exciting and dynamic, allowing players to feel like the heroes of the stories by the heroic nature of the situations they find themselves in. Think dynamically while leaving room for interesting narrative or lore discoveries either at the beginning, during, or after the encounter. You want to create a set that instantly makes the PCs feel like the main characters of this story the second they walk onto it. Thank you so much for watching this video, and if you enjoy the content, please consider subscribing to The Infinite Construct and follow me on Twitter for regular Numenera material.